everyone, and welcome to the Cancer Support Communities Educational Webinar. I am Kathy Riley, the Associate Director of Programs at CSCLA, and I'm honored to welcome you to this week's webinar titled Getting Back on Track, Helping Young Adults Navigate a Life Interrupted. Before we begin, if this is your first time joining us, Cancer Support Community in Los Angeles is a premier nonprofit organization providing vital social and emotional support to families facing cancer, including patients, caregivers, and their loved ones, all at no cost. Our programs include support groups, healthy lifestyle classes, social activities, and educational programs such as this one. If you would like to learn more about our services or watch past webinars, please visit cancersupportla.org. And before I introduce uh, today's speakers, please note that your video and microphone are automatically disabled for this webinar. You may though enter your questions into the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window at any time. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We may not be able to get to all of your questions today, but we'll get to as many as possible. And I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, Aura Cooperberg brings passion, insight, and wisdom to the AYA program at USC, uh, addressing the psychosocial needs of adolescents and young adults with cancer. It was early in her career while doing her social work internship at Children's Hospital Los Angeles when she first dreamed of establishing support programs for these vulnerable young people. She earned a PhD and a dual master's degree from USC. Mario Espedia is a licensed clinical social worker in California with over 15 years of experience in healthcare and community-based mental health settings. He is passionate about collaborating with other healthcare providers to improve the quality of life of those with cancer and other medical conditions. And before joining the AYA team, Mario worked for an outpatient palliative care clinic, providing psychosocial support and advanced care planning services. He obtained his doctorate in social work from USC and has experience developing continuing educational programs for social workers. And it gives me the greatest pleasure to welcome Aura and Mario. And feel free to uh, let us see you and I will hand things over to, uh, to both of you. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. And you can hear me well, I hope. We yes. can hear you well, and uh, and we can see you. So. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, I want to welcome everyone to our talk on getting back on track, helping young adults navigate a life interrupted. I'm Aura Cooperberg. Uh, like Kathy uh, introduced me, thank you so much. I'm a project manager for AYA at USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. You know, I have like, I think Kathy kind of um, acknowledged that I have uh, been in this, it's a lifelong career, really over 40 years. And I've witnessed during this lifelong career, both teenagers at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and now young adults at USC Norris and how a cancer diagnosis ruptures a young person's life and more importantly, creates a roadblock that may derail one's normal life course. A young adult once said to me, cancer throws you into a different universe. So I think that's probably what it feels like for most patients and their families. And I know that um, we've already, Kathy, uh, let's see, this is the next uh, slide, please. Um, okay, great. I, I know that we've already kind of acknowledged who's speaking. I know Shu had a family uh, emergency today, so she won't be here to speak, but these uh, both, uh, all of us put this together. And I just want to also acknowledge the two students, Swathi uh, Bala G and Alicia Ko, who are the student graduate students in public health that really helped us so much in putting this together. Thank you. Now a little bit about background that's important for everybody to know, because I'm not sure everybody knows what AYA stands for. AYA um, is, uh, stands for 
adolescents and young adults, and that's 15 to 39 years of age. And there are approximately 90,000 AYAs diagnosed with cancer per year in the United States. One in 500 to 600 white AYAs are cancer survivors. So that's quite a big number. Although the types of cancer uh, that occur in young adults, you, you know, sometimes occur at, uh, in other age groups as well, young adults are largely different. Um, those kinds of cancers are largely different in children and older adults. This chart includes some of the most common cancers in young adults, ages 20 to 39. And that includes breast, thyroid, testicular, melanoma, and others in the other 55% include sarcomas, lymphomas, non-Hodgkins and Hodgkins and, collect and colorectal uh, cancers. And, oh, and also, I'm sorry, lastly, of course, brain and spinal cord tumors. Even within the young adult age group, these cancers differ as young people age. So for example, you'll find leukemia, lymphoma, testicular, and thyroid cancer most common in 15 to 24 year olds, and breast cancer and melanoma most common in 35 to 39 year olds. I'd like to share a little bit of a history, especially because I've been in this field for so long, that it wasn't until the, the late 1990s that the medical and scientific community recognized that adolescents and young adults with cancer needed special attention. And that is because it was found that 15 to 39 year old cancer patients showed little or no survival um, sur uh, improved it, it survival rates as compared with younger and older age groups. This was identified as the AYA gap. Over time, four key areas unique to this age group were found to contribute to this gap. Number one was the unique developmental stage. Just at a time when life you know, was so difficult, cancer throws a wrench into the normal age-related uh, challenges such as school, work, learning to be independent. And of course the life demands and physical changes of this time period uh, makes it even more complex. And then secondly, delayed diagnosis was also reported as contributing to the AYA gap. How many times have I heard from fellow, you know, from the patients that I've worked with stories about how doctors just didn't uh, believe them? You know, they, they felt like their symptoms were psychological and not real. Um, and also delayed diagnosis could also be due to limited healthcare access, lack of insurance and misdiagnosis. I also think on the other side for patients, a delay in diagnosis might also be attributed to the young adult themselves feeling embarrassed and reluctant to get something checked out by a doctor. The third contribution to this gap is limited enrollment in clinical trials because clinical trials are key to improving treatment protocols. Barriers to AYA participation in clinical trials is well documented. I have read it and heard about it ever since I've started in this field, such as lack of existing trials, limited access, and lack of physician awareness of relevant trials. And finally, the unique cancer biology found in some young adults with cancer may contribute to this gap as well. AYAs may have a genetic may have genetic changes leading to more aggressive cancers and poor outcomes. So thus to improve AYA survival, addressing these challenges requires involving AYAs in clinical designs, providing information in a relevant format and offering resources to alleviate financial and psychosocial burdens. Well, this diagram really is, it's overwhelming at times. I look at it and I, it really illustrates the many psychosocial challenges AYAs may face peer relations, financial, career education, or just a few that the emerging young adult might experience. These disruptions combined with greater life demands for this age group calls for increased attention and targeted interventions. So we will hear from Mario a little bit uh, in a few minutes on the clinic, as, you know, as, as he was introduced as our clinical social worker on our AYA team, and he'll talk about 
these challenges uh, with his, that he has actually personally uh, come across with his patients. You know, and to help us design workshops, and later on I'll talk to you about those workshops and other programs that we offer, we asked a group of young adults that attended several in-person events to write their top three concerns. The pie chart here shows the number one concern of 13 of the participants that filled out the sur survey. Mental health is the top concern, followed by social isolation and survivorship. Fear of recurrence and finances were also identified. And you see the words on the right-hand side of this um, slide are the concerns, are all the three concerns that uh, the young adults had written down. And um, you can see kind of just the, the combination of all the different concerns that are very typical of this age group. It's interesting, this morning, I just read a, um, just quickly, just before this talk, I read about a recent Harvard survey, survey that finds depression and anxiety may impact adults, young adults, twice as much as teens. And I found that really fascinating because the finding really has implications for our young adult population. And the fact that mental health uh, is such a big uh, challenge for this age group. Here is a short video. I'm gonna start describing our program specifically. So here's a short video to introduce our AYA at USC program at Norris. AYA is adolescents and young adults who have been diagnosed with cancer between the ages of 15 and oh. <laughs> AYA is adolescents and young adults who have been diagnosed with cancer between the ages of 15 and 39. AYA years are hard enough. A cancer diagnosis makes it even harder. Often leaving patients feeling frustrated and alone. That's why USC's AYA program uses a multidisciplinary approach. We build peer supportive programming and community for patients and their loved ones. We want patients to know that they're not alone. Okay, next slide. Yeah, this is our mission statement. In 2013, AYA at USC was established to represent a collaboration between USC, Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center in the hospital, LAC, USC, and CHLA, which is Children's Hospital. Clinical services uh, were uh, launched at USC Norris in 2014. Okay, next slide is um, our mission is accomplished by our wonderful team. We have two medical co-directors, a nurse uh, navigator, Elaine and Mario, our social worker, myself and Shu is the program administrator. And our program areas that we'll just discuss today we have, uh, we do, uh, I think even more than this, but we will, this, this is the focus of today's talk, are the three clinical care, supportive programming, and community outreach. And now I'd like to introduce Mario, and he will speak about the clinical care and his role and, the, and some of the issues that have come up with his young adults. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Aura. And thank you, uh, Cancer Support Community, for welcoming us today. Uh, I'm Mario Espitia, the social worker, li licensed clinical social worker for our AYA at, at USC program. Uh, Aura provided uh, a snapshot there, pictures of, of those that make up this AYA team here at USC. And uh, I must say that uh, I've been here for about six months uh, working for this program. And it has been very essential for me to work together with uh, Elaine, who's our registered nurse, nurse navigator. And uh, here on this slide, I, uh, we're providing just a, a really short, really small glimpse of the nurse navigator and some of her tasks, some of the ways that she provides support to our AYA patients. And the list is longer, but uh, just to keep it brief, she assesses for symptoms and side effects of treatments. Uh, 
she mediates and facilitates communication between the patients and their providers. She connects our patients to clinical trials, facilitates access to medications. Uh, there are times where the medications and the treatments are, are, are so expensive. Uh, she's able to connect with uh, grants or with uh, pharmaceutical companies that may be able to provide uh, these treatments at a lower uh, or, or free of cost. Uh, she educates our patients on their treatment options. And while our providers here at USC do provide um, a very clear treatment plan to our patients, uh, we know and we understand that it's nerve wracking. It's uh, is shocking to learn about a diagnosis. And so uh, Elaine is very great and our nurse navigators are very great at uh, providing additional education and information. And she refers to other services uh, such as uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy. As I mentioned earlier, I've, I've been here at the AYA at USC program for about six months, and it's been, it's been a real honor and pleasure to meet the, the different AYA patients here. And I'm also fortunate to say that my role is very flexible. Uh, I'm able to see patients uh, while, while they're admitted at the hospital. I'm able to see them in the outpatient clinics, radiation, radiology at the BMT clinic if needed. And also I'm, a, I'm accessible over phone. So I have a position that uh, really I, I can see patients anywhere within our center. And one of my basic functions, like one of the most important functions is to conduct what uh, we call a so psychosocial assessment. Uh, Aura spoke about it briefly earlier but it's really an opportunity to assess and uh, to identify any potential needs, concerns, any gaps that our patients are experiencing in their, in their current life due to their uh, either a new diagnosis or, or due to the long-term effects, uh, psychosocial effect, uh, impacts, uh, as a patient continues getting treatments over time. And so we, as I assess for social support. I won't read them all, but I'll name a few. We assess for financial status, for mental health needs. Uh, we assess for advanced care planning, medical literacy. Do our patients understand at each stage uh, the, the treatment plan and the options they're being provided with? And so uh, due to lack of time, uh, I won't delve into each one of those psychosocial areas uh, and aspects of a person's life, but I have identified uh, the top three psychosocial concerns or uh, needs or, or considerations. Uh, those are uh, finances, mental health, and fertility preservation. And I'll speak a, a bit on uh, each of these. And I, ha I didn't list them uh, in any order of uh, high need to low need. And also uh, by listing three of these concerns, I in no means, uh, I'm in no means in ignoring uh, that the other needs, psychosocial needs are also important. But uh, when I first meet with our patients uh, and especially those that are newly diagnosed, what we end up finding or what most of the patients end up communicating to me is that their one of their biggest concerns is finances. They're, uh, they're diagnosed and all of, a, all of a sudden their life is turned uh, upside down. And one of those, uh, one of the, things in their lives that's interrupted is their employment. This means they're spending their time at the hospital, at the clinic, at the outpatient clinics most days out of the week and not, and not at work. And that means a decreased income. Uh, 
for for anyone a, a decreased income uh, impacts or puts at risk uh, the basic needs of life housing food clothing uh, and also yes uh, other other expenses that we incur in our daily life car purchasing a car purchasing like uh, our car insurance, gas with the high co cost these days, childcare, et cetera, the list goes on. And so this is a huge source of distress for our AYA patients. Some of the interventions or some of the resources that I educate or connect our patients with are uh, the state disability program here in California. Social Security disability programs uh, such as SSDI or SSI. In addition to programs that are offered uh, through these uh, government agencies, we also uh, I also attempt to connect our patients to uh, foundation grants or financial assistance programs. For those that are students, they may uh, seek accommodations through the student services departments at their universities or their colleges. There are some barriers though. Uh, uh, unfortunately for those patients who uh, may be undocumented, they may not have access to uh, many of the government programs, uh, including uh, found foundation grants and financial assistance. So in some cases, while I may not be able to connect, we, we may not be able to connect some of our patients with some of these resources, uh, we do engage in a brainstorming, troubleshooting session, ongoing sessions to identify support systems, to identify other resources that may be able to supplement those basic needs of housing, food and security, clothing, et cetera. Uh, another uh, high con uh, concern, psychosocial concern, is mental and behavioral health. Uh, many of our patients, uh, whether you know, duly diagnosed or or more uh, advanced into their uh, medical uh, progression of their medical condition, uh, many report that they're feeling. Uh, depressed, that they're feeling anxious, uh, having panic attacks at different times of, of their day or, their, or, or, their, or during their week. And, and in some cases, we have had patients that also report uh, suicidal ideation. And uh, they, they list various, various uh, distressors uh, sources of distress that are contributing to these feelings of depression, of anxiety, of worry. And one of those uh, sources of distress are lifestyle changes. As I mentioned earlier, our patients are having, are going about their daily life uh, working or, or going to school if they're enrolled in a college or university. And when they're, for, and then when they're diagnosed, or when they're needing to uh, access their ongoing treatments, they have a disruption. If, if they're in school, they will decrease, uh, they may find that they need to decrease their course load or seek accommodations, find alternate ways of completing their coursework. And yes, in some cases, our AYA patients uh, may need to go on a medical leave. And this is a source of distress for them because this delays their graduation this delays starting a career that they're excited and passionate about, which leads to the distress of, of needing to stop uh, their, their work. Uh, many are in their early, uh, early in their careers and uh, find that their, the advancement that they seek in their career is also then delayed. Uh, other lifestyle changes are around family and social life. Uh, you know, it's a 20s, 30s is a time in a person's life when uh, for the, the majority of the of, uh, young adults are out and about, going out with their friends to the, 
uh, to the clubs, to the malls, movie theaters, traveling, you name it. And unfortunately, the many face a disruption in that part of their life as well. Uh, one, because of their medical condition, uh, they may be immunocompromised. And so the doctors recommend for them to avoid large groups. Uh, and, and for many, that means uh, staying at home. Uh, other sources of distress, the hospital admissions being confined uh, in these small rooms for four, at least four to five days, sometimes 30, sometimes uh, more, more than 30 days. Uh, the symptoms and the side effects of treatments can be very distressing for our AYA youth as well. Uh, the impact of treatments and the medical conditions on body image is a source of distress and isolation. Uh, many of the AYAs feel alone, feel that they're separated from their loved ones, from their friends, as I mentioned earlier, in the lifestyle changes. Uh, and because of hospital admissions, uh, most, of the, most of the patients end up spending all those five to 30 days by themselves, sometimes with very, very limited uh, visit, oppor uh, visiting opportunities, especially when the pandemic was around. And so some of the interventions that I'm able to provide here at the at USC Norris are short-term counseling, uh, suicide risk screening, and for more ongoing uh, mental health support, I refer to mental health counseling services uh, throughout various uh, count, uh, mental health, behavioral health organizations in LA County, either through the Department of Mental Health, or we connect them with mental health providers through their insurance, HMO, or PPO plans. I also refer our patients to support groups, such as the one that we provide uh, once a month here at USC virtually. I also refer them to recreational educational life skills programming, uh, which uh, we also provide here at USC, but also know that other organizations such as Cancer Support Community offer great uh, uh, programming as well. And so we will connect our patients with, uh, with these community organizations as well. And uh, finally, a third uh, consideration in this case uh, to explore with our AYA youth uh, is fertility preservation. Uh, so I'm not a medical expert here, but of course what I have learned uh, over time, especially from my colleague, uh, the nurse navigator, is that uh, the treatments of uh, chemotherapy treatments, radiation, may cause a person to become infertile. And uh, there's a high, ch high chance for that to happen. And so when a patient is uh, first diagnosed, the medical provider will provide uh, not only the, the diagnosis, uh, not only the treatment plan for, uh, for that medical condition, but will also provide fertility preservation as, as an option, as something that a, a youth uh, could consider due to the high risk of, of the treatments. And so at that point, uh, Elaine and I get called in to meet with the youth. Uh, and some of the interventions uh, and resources that we engage in are, uh, we explore concerns about their ability to have biological children in the future. We reflect with them on that. Uh, some express concern because they do want to have children and some uh, are not so concerned. So there's kind of a, a, a range there of experiences amongst our AYA uh, uh, patients here at USC uh, from wanting kids to not wanting kids. Uh, or finding kind of other options for having, uh, for potentially having children in the future. So we reflect on that. Uh, we also educate 
on fertility preservation and explore with our patients if that is of interest to them. Uh, we identify potential facilitators and barriers for this fertility preservation process. Uh, for some, costs may be a barrier. Uh, the minimum cost of fertility preservation is uh, at least $350 uh, for just to start uh, and for one year of the banking. We also explore cultural and religious factors. Uh, is uh, what is your what does your culture teach you about uh, children about procreate procreating uh, your religion as well? What does it teach you about uh, uh, what? How does it influence your in your decision making for moving forward with fertility preservation or not? And another potential facilitator or barrier are uh, family planning goals. So we, we do run into uh, young adults who uh, are married. And so it's important to engage both partners in this conversation, of course, with the patient's consent. Most times they consent. Sometimes uh, the partners are uh, one, they're, they're their desire for having children uh, is clashing. One wants to have children, the other doesn't. There's uh, fears related to having children, especially when one partner is diagnosed with cancer or they might have a family history of cancer. Uh, the other part, uh, some, uh, one of the parties is uh, highly stressed out about that and passing down cancer to their children is a fear. Uh, so there's a lot of exploration and reflection on on these topics uh, and and their goals for for having a family in the future or whatever that may look like for them. And if a, per, a patient does decide they want to move forward with fertility preservation, then uh, we make sure that we coordinate the process, uh, connect them with the cryobank. Uh, they either make an appointment as an outpatient. Uh, we also have patients who are admitted at the hospital and want to move forward with fertility preservation. So uh, they they may they need they may need to provide a sample while admitted and have a family member deliver the sample to the cryobank within one hour of producing the sample. Uh, so if there's a lot of coordination, a lot of filling out of paperwork. Ensuring that the process goes smoothly so that then the patient can focus on uh, the next thing that's most important to them, which is to start uh, their the cancer treatments. And so um, that's a small glimpse of just the top three kind of most most uh, pressing needs and concerns of the AYAs and what they have communicated with me in the last six months. And again, uh, without disregarding the other psychosocial areas and, and areas of need and concern. And so um, now I pass it over back to Aura, who will provide an overview of the supportive programming that's part of our AYA at USCAU program. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Okay. Yeah, supported program. Just to actually, to clarify, Mario is the social worker at USC at Norris and our supportive, supportive programming, which uh, you know is housed at Norris is available though for other treatment centers. Um, I think that that's an important piece of information. So here we are, I have a, uh, just I'm gonna change the, um, the slide, let's see. Mar uh, just one slide, Mario, can you change the slide on that? I, I'm not sharing the, um, uh, uh, not, no, uh, back to the house, I guess. Did we, okay, great, thank you. Okay, we, um, we borrowed a theory called third space and that's on that slide, third space home. This third space was coined, the term was coined by a sociologist, Ray Oldenburg, and refer to a communal space as a disti as distinct from home, which is the first uh, first space, 
or work and school, which is the second space. In our case, it was a concept, not a real, not a real space or place. It's just basically a concept. And this conceptual framework is symbolized here, like I said, by this house that holds multiple supportive care projects, activities, and initiatives that focus on helping young adults cope, heal, and continue on their developmental trajectory. So why is the third space important for young adults? A cancer diagnosis during this life stage is rare with very few other young adults with cancer for those who were diagnosed to relate to. And I have heard from adolescents treated in pediatric centers that they many times share rooms with two-year-olds when they're in the hospital or young adults in adult facilities only see older patients. So we make sure that young adults are not alone. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so our goal in this third space is to address the whole person. Looking at the whole person is particularly important for young adults. Like for instance, I have heard many, many, many times young adults saying, young people saying to me, I don't wanna be identified as a cancer patient or um, identity, you know, I just, I, I'm just not, I am not just a patient. So identity formation, like who we are, who you want to be and who you wanna be with can have lifelong impact. And through education, engagement, empowerment, and leadership, you can find the right kind of support in our program and information to improve your quality of life. Oops. Okay, so these are some of the special workshops uh, under, uh, under our, um, our willingness and ability to provide education and our special workshops in the past, these are just examples, pain management, insurance, sexual health, fatigue, are important topics and, and certainly necessary for young people to uh, hear about. So our program provides education through special workshops, like I said, and these examples based uh, are really, uh, like I said, just a few. Based on Dr. Zebrecht's studies, 60% of young adults expressed a need for cancer information. Our special workshops provide valuable information. And you know, those are things, when I say valuable, sometimes people look to the internet or to social media. And I think it's really important to have experts and professionals there to, um, to be able to identify and speak about you know, these important topics for young people. And they really help pa patients manage the burden of their cancer and treatment. And these are just two examples See, since the pandemic, our workshops are now virtual and now able to reach people at any location. Among many workshops we have had, these two are great examples. Uh, although, for instance, there's a growing uh, literature on the impact of cancer on sexuality, we still know that holding conversations about sex and sexuality may be difficult for healthcare professionals and embarrassing for patients. Dr. Lawson on the right uh, a psychologist with years of experience and a practice in the field presented an extremely frank and open workshop on sex and relationships after cancer. It was such an important topic, especially for young adults that we actually had her come back twice to present. And then on the left are Ask the Experts as part of a series and we present skilled professionals in different fields. This flyer announces a topic presented by USC Norris genetic team who shared their expertise, not just once, but twice also. So building peer support through social activities. This is uh, engagement on many different levels. Peers play an important role in the development for young adults. For certainly disruption in one's social life may have a tremendous lifelong impact. So having a supportive cancer community of peers counteracts a devastating sense of isolation. Support from family and friends uh, are necessary and also very important, but meeting others in the same boat that have gone through the same thing that truly understand can provide a unique kind of support. In fact, studies have uh, shown that uh, 
that meeting other cancer patients is a number one need for many young adults. But life situations differ. That is why it is important that we offer specific opportunities. Um, we engage um, to engage those that are single, coupled, and a parent with cancer. So for example, our signature annual three-day retreat is for patients only. For couples, we have sporting events such as the Clipper game and include, that includes a catered meal and social time prior to the game. And for parents with cancer, we offer a day at the zoo for their family, a catered lunch, followed by concurrent support groups for parents and children. In fact, we partner, and we're very excited, with the cancer support community who provide the group for children. So thank you. And now I'm going to, hold on, run a three minute, oops. So I can go ahead and share um, my screen now for the video. Okay, thank you, Swavi. Should I stop my video then? Yeah. I'm going to stop my video. Throughout my entire treatment, I've been around really young people, like pediatric or really old people and it's really hard to relate and talk and it's like I feel like I've been alone. It's a really isolating experience. If you talk to any AYA, they'll almost always say they were the only young person in the hospital or they didn't meet another AYA until they got to like a group like this. And you see just how much that connection is needed, even in support groups, you know, if it's not specifically a young adult support group, there are really different challenges that people with cancer are going through. We really have gone through something unique. And it's a challenge to find people to understand what you're going through. And so the process of understanding and relating is a process of healing. And I think that, you know, by meeting other people, we get to heal with each other. Once you know someone has been through something similar to you, then you feel less alone. There, there's a lot of dark humor and there's a lot of relatable stuff you get from other AYAs, other cancer survivors. In this community, humor is the is some of the best medicine that you can ever have. Yeah, it alleviates a lot of the darkness around it talking, just talking out loud. And so this is a chance to actually spend some time and talk with others who just get it. The experience of I was diagnosed with cancer and this has changed the trajectory of my life and it's changed how I view the world and what I want to do with my life. Just being around people with same experiences, it kind of motivates you to do more. I also get like a push to be more open, more extroverted. We grow, we see each other succeeding and uh, we, you know, that creates the possibility that we can succeed. I am like three and a half years in remission and I definitely still struggle uh, with past trauma and isolation and the worries of a reoccurrence. And so it was wonderful to hear from some people who are a little further down the line about how it gets better, but how it's also okay to still be struggling. I think I would be really lost if I didn't have uh, cancer friends to talk to about this stuff. That's really helped me kind of put my life in perspective that I'm doing okay. I was nervous. I'm not here. I just, I didn't know. I was anxious. Never had that support group or didn't know who to connect with or to bond with or who to, you know, put you out of a mistake with. Now I feel like I'm a child. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm mean, such a joy, such laughter, and peace being here, and then, all, you know, interacting with all of you, and I'm just I'm so thankful and grateful for this opportunity and future events. Oops. <laughs> Okay, thank you. It really, I think the um, it's so important to hear from young adults themselves. It really captures what connection means and how important it is. 
this is, once again, getting back to our third space, we talk about empowerment. And people find that the expression of feelings in creative endeavors meets some of their deepest needs. It gives time to be playful, to be less stressed and more relaxed, to share their core self and to feel more in control. I think both of the creative and wellness workshops that we provide empower young adults to take charge of their life and improve their quality of life. Many of the activities contribute to a patient's toolbox of techniques and skills to help them cope with their cancer experience. And here are just some other photos of different activities uh, that we provide during uh, the course of the year to kind of uh, create those connections. And the third space, our last piece that we provide, and not the last, not the least, is leadership. And we uh, I'm going to describe the development of an AYA council. You know, during the pandemic and sudden lack of connection with our AYA community, really sparked the development of our AYA Young Adult Council. Many of our young adults expressed profound sense of isolation at that time and a return to familiar feelings they had experienced when newly diagnosed. We contacted some of uh, our AYAs who had participated in past events and invited them to participate on the council. Um, you know, well, and really was, uh, this is when we began our virtual part of our third space. Uh, we also partnered with our patient experience department at Norris to offer the AYA voice to projects in our healthcare system. As consultants, our young adults helped create some of the workshops and activities of our last two retreats. So um, we're just so grateful. And we were able to, a great opportunity to present our AYA patient council as a model for patient engagement and empowerment. The poster that you see right here was uh, presented at the fifth Global Cancer Congress this past June and gave our AWA Council credibility and recognition as an evidence-based, dynamic, and effective approach to patient care and improved healthcare system. So, uh, so where to access the third space? Inside the four walls at Norris, you can do it at home on Zoom. We have both in and outpatient kind of activities uh, at Norris or outside the four walls when we go to the zoo, the stadium, concert, retreats, among other things. And what time, let's see, I'm looking at the time. I just wanna be, um, I, I will go through community outreach. Just, I'll just touch base on it because I see time is kind of running out and I wanna make sure we have time for any questions. Um, Next slide, community outreach um, includes, it's a program area and it really does help with, um, it is important to have community outreach to AYAs and to our supportive programs, to know that our supportive programs are open uh, to other treatment centers. So um, more than 80% of AYAs treated in the community setting without multidisciplinary care um, are, um, are, are, you know, it's really something that is 80% and in, in, are treated in community settings. And that really makes a difference. First of all, NCI recommends that ca cancer centers have expertise in the management of AYAs and with that access to clinical trials. It's a very important piece. Also due to insurance and unfamiliarity of AYA cancer care, many AYAs have no access to AYA programs. So it's really, an important thing to follow up on. And this is just a, a, a list of all our AYA at USC community outreach areas that we provide. Next slide. We really do make an impact. We've had over 4,000 attendees at our virtual or in-person education and outreach activities. Next slide. Um, so we've been really fortunate to have college ambassadors to support the program. We've had amazing volunteers and students who have helped our program and have become advocates for AYA. We have a, a spotlight 
that we have in our newsletter, and those are um, they spotlight young people that have can that have cancer or healthcare professionals, and they tell their story, and that can be seen in our newsletter and on our website. We have high school ambassadors as well. This program brings knowledge, awareness, and encourages careers in healthcare professions through AYA events, health education, community engagement, and social media awareness. Here are two examples of speakers that were presented uh, that spoke at high schools around healthcare issues. It's wonderful that they're able to do that. Okay. And finally, to promote awareness in the community, we are also partnering with different cancer organizations and community partners through newsletters, social media campaigns, cancer education seminars and events such as American Cancer Society, summer camps, high schools, and community clinics. And these are... Um, We're using our AYA, the website, the monthly email newsletter, like I said, social media, YouTube channels to connect. And our videos are uh, in our library if anybody would like to um, listen to any, any of our past speakers. And now testimonials. I just wanna to touch on, I won't read them, but the key words that come up with some of our testimonials are saved my life, that's a big one underrepresented group and support is paramount. I think those are three things I get from that testimonial. It's certainly important that this person says to connect, to close lots of gaps and to get better information and resources and support. Okay. Once again, connection. I think the, I like trade feedback and new friendships are important for this person. So in addition to the benefits for patients and families, having an AYA program just in general provides age-specific treatment by a multidisciplinary team, gives an AYA perspective to the healthcare system, helps enhance awareness of AYA through community outreach, newsletters, and professional development, and bridges and creates a bridge between a pediatric and adult facility. So here is how you can get involved if you'd like to visit our website, aya.usc.edu, or our monthly emails. You can ask to be to get to receive those, or um, I guess follow up in social media at aya usc. You could share your story at our aya spotlight, or keep up with our aya news and connect. And so I just want the last, I think it's the last, um, the next, next um, is, thank you. Thank you all for being here. And I'm, we're open to answer your questions. If there's anything you'd like to um, ask, please feel free. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kathy. Yeah, Ara and uh, and Mario, I invite you to come come back on as well. It mm -hmm. what a meaningful presentation. Mm -hmm. I I learned uh, so much from the two of you, and thank you for the scope and the breadth of what you covered today. I think it'll be a great help to to many. We do have a couple of questions that have come in, and I think we can uh, can ask them of you before we have to end mm -hmm. our time together. But someone is asking, what are the hospitals doing on their end as far as outreach to patients who are long-term survivors yes. and no longer in treatment to provide them information on survivorship plans? I don't know, Mario. I would say that in, at Norris, right, we have the, of course, the survivorship um, clinic. So there is a team with Dr. Fryer. Uh, we have uh, the the nurse, um, and uh, I, I think there is even social work uh, coverage for that too. So, and I know that they're expanding, but they're very, very um, committed to building that up. And we also are able for programming. I know I do, we do make sure that we send all our information to them so people can be involved in that as well. 
what do you, Maury, would you like to add anything? I, I would think that that's what we're doing at Norris. You, you covered it, Aura. I guess I would just uh, stress that the programming, uh, the events and the workshops yeah. uh, are open uh, and accept, uh, survivors can access those programs. Right. And I think that's really an important uh, piece of information. Um, someone is also asking um, where they can enroll um, in the retreat. Oh, that's great. Well, just, you know, I presume you could get on the website or I could also, that's at um, our website is usually, she was so good at this. It's usc.edu. Um, that's AYA at usc.edu. And um, I don't know. And then I, you could also uh, email SHU, which is, I should be more prepared for this. Sorry, guys. And that is, um, hold on. Let me see. And I should know this by heart, but it's it's S-H-U-L-I at USC.edu. You could probably put that in the chat, but. And Shu, you know, she really takes a lot of the referrals. That next retreat will be, we have it once a year. We just had one in September, but so we'll have one next September. But you know, it's good to That's, get that is in the, we put it in the chat. Um, uh, I see yeah, that. Yeah, the second okay. time that was put in, the spelling is correct. Right. Thank so you. I'll add that. Um, additionally, um, what are the eligibility factors for young adult cancer survivors to participate in your supportive programming? Uh, for example, mm -hmm. are particular geographical area, um, age, um, you know, what are some of those eligibility factors? Um, I know for Mario, that's really uh, patients that are, you know, at Norris, that is very more specific to Norris, but our programming is open to anybody. The location is fine. The support group would have to be in California, anybody from California. Um, but the other programs uh, could be open to other people. Certainly the workshops are, are open to anybody that wants to participate. And workshops could be, you know, patients, family members, you know, anybody that wants to come on and learn more about some of these topics we have. In fact, we, we're having one on, um, on Thursday on screen, um, th screening, I'm not prepared, this is, Sorry, guys, this is like, a, she was usually prepared for that, but there is something about, it's screening for cancer, for second cancers and things. I think it's really important. Dr. Fryer is gonna be speaking and the people from the clinic, from the survivorship clinic and from genetics will be speaking. So I think that's really something that a lot of people may be interested in. Um, but so those kinds of workshops are open to everyone. Uh, where the pro program wise, we are, um, you know, if, if people want to participate in our different activities, that's generally open to everybody too. So I, I'm, you know, it's interesting, Kathy, I think about, because you know, from all our work together is that early on, you know, at Children's, I work with childhood cancer survivors. And that is a different, it is a different population. If you're a childhood cancer from you know, earlier than the teen years to that earlier than AYA. And we have had some people that have been involved. So I, I would say it probably depends um, on whether someone would really gain anything from it, but, uh, you know, from participating, but I would say it's, you know, many things are open to also childhood cancer survivors. Thank you. And then a, a final question, what, what future plans do you have for your program? Um, I love that. Yes. Yeah. And what do you dream? I might add that. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now we're working with trying to um, uh, create a, a stronger bridge between Children's Hospital and our, our program. So you have teens and young adults, uh, you know, programming why, for both, you know, and for making sure when people age out of one, they can come over to the other. Um, that's number one. That's always been a dream, and it's something we're working on. Um, 
as far as our program, you know, there is always, uh, <laughs> there is, you, know, it, you could do many, many things. Much of it has to do with the resources we have, both, you know, financial and people, <laughs> people resource. But there are, um, you know, certainly other kinds of retreats we could provide if there was, uh, you know, an ability to do that. Um, and more workshops, I would say. Wonderful. Uh, additionally, uh, for those attending, I just put the um, the link in, uh, the registration link for this Thursday's event. Thank um, you so no, much. Yes. You're, you're welcome. Well, we have reached um, the end of our time together, and I'd like to thank um, Ora Kuperberg and Mario Espedia for their time today and for sharing your expertise with us. If you would like to learn more about the cancer support community support groups and some of those were mentioned um, today you can visit our website at www.cancersupportla.org you can also email us any questions you have about our programming at info at cancersupportla.org and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for your engagement and very thoughtful questions. Great. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.